it's my pleasure today to introduce Neville Blanty. Um, Neville graduated in 1970 from the University of Auckland. From there, he moved to the University of Canterbury, where, where he's been ever since, and uh, where he served as the head of the department for the past six years. Since getting to know Neville, I've come to appreciate his many and varied contributions to behavior analysis from his published work that ranges from basic research on choice and preference and on behavioral pharmacology in pigeons to his applied uh, work uh, on uh, binge eating and infant sleep disturbances. I think it's fair to say that Neville is a quintessential translational scientist. Throughout his career, he has championed the cause of single case research designs in clinical settings, a challenging endeavor indeed. I suspect, however, that this challenge pales into comparison to that he has faced over the past six months or so when he's tried to run a department from tents, offices, makeshift offices, and so forth since the earthquake in uh, Christchurch. Anyhow, please join me in welcoming Neville Blanty. And the title of his talk today is Single Case Research, Useful Tools for the 21st Century Applied Science. Ray, thank you very much for that uh, kind and gracious introduction. And um, thank you to the organizers for the op opportunity to say what I'm going to say today. It's a, something that I have long wanted to say to an audience of this kind. And thank you all for coming, because I know that there's, in fact, free rock concert downtown. So um, this is a very impressive. I have to apologize to Ray, because actually I uh, have changed my title. Um, it's actually essential tools. So I'll pause a moment for anyone who wants to leave now because they didn't come to hear that. The context of what I want to say today is in what I perceive as very fundamental challenge that uh, applied research of the kind that we do in the behavioral sciences is facing in the 21st century. Uh, just noting that, of course, our field has been distinctive, I think, because it's had a very long commitment to the desire, the aspiration, to be an applied science. Now, the quotation from the, the father of clinical psychology, dated 1907, indicates as tell. In fact, you could go back earlier. Uh, Whitmer first talked about applied psychology in the clinical sense back in uh, 1898. And so this has been a long-term aspiration, a very honorable aspiration, one of which we can be very proud. But I think that we're facing a major crisis and it's really that crisis and perhaps its solution that I'm going to talk about today. We have, first of all, the paradox that we have in our field a commitment to evidence-based practice. And that, again, is a commitment of which we can be proud. That the idea of the scientist practitioner, the idea of evidence-based practice, is a very great and honorable and estimable achievement. And yet we have at the heart of this the astonishing paradox that for more than 75 years, we've simply refused to face the evidence that the scientific method that we base our evidence on is deeply flawed. So there's that paradox. Commitment to evidence-based practice, absolute refusal to consider evidence that our practice may be not what it should be. And associated with that is the second challenge, which is that there is, I think, an, an enduring mismatch between the model of science in the scientist-practitioner model and what the practitioner needs that science to deliver. And we have made little progress, I think, in resolving that aspect of the problem that we face as well. So it's how we might meet those challenges that I want to talk about today. Let me stress again, I'm speaking about applied science. What I have to say may well have implications for basic science, but that's not my theme. So it's about applied science. I'm going to use the term the standard model, short for the standard model of research, quite a lot. So I want to say something about what it is that I mean by this. What is the standard model? Well, it had its origins in, in agricultural research in the United Kingdom in the 1920s. That's its most proximate beginning. And it's based on the work of Ronald or Sir Ronald Fisher. And it began to influence psychology in the 1930s. So it's not uh, 
a, a recent phenomenon, it's quite an old phenomenon in our history as the history of the behavioral sciences goes. Now Fisher made very imp important contributions across a range of fields. He was a genuinely um, towering intellectual figure. Uh, but of interest to us is that he designed or improved on things like control groups, randomization, he really invented factorial designs and analysis of variance, and he also adapted uh, Gossett's t-test to a family of null hypothesis statistical tests. And it's important to recognize, as Johnson and Pennypacker point out, that for their purposes, Fisher's statistical methods were very good. I don't want to give the impression that they were uh, entirely wrong. Uh, for the kinds of things that Fisher designed them for, which were population genetics, for um, agricultural research, and as other people, his contemporaries, adapted them for industrial quality control, they worked fine. They led, however, to what some people have called an inference revolution in psychology. Beginning in the 1930s, in fact, I think the first uses of analysis of variance in psychology date from uh, 1936. You see that there was a very rapid adoption from the perspective of the history of the sociology of science, this is an extraordinarily rapid acquisition of an entirely new set of experimental and data analytic techniques, which really was complete by about the early 1950s. And you can see that there was a rapid acceleration in the adoption of these techniques in the 1950s, um, and that uh, from about here, and that essentially it asymptoted so that now uh, over 90% of all published research in psychology uses Fisherian standard model data analytic techniques. What were the key attributes of this standard model? What did this inference revolution deliver to psychology? Well, this is a very sketchy summary, and each of these bullet points could be elaborated at some length. But we postulate a null hypothesis about one or more populations. We recruit as large a sample size as possible, that's to reduce sampling error. We randomly allocate uh, participants to treatment conditions. That was one of Fisher's genuinely important innovations. Of course, he, it counteracts uh, implicit and explicit um, allocation biases. We then aggregate individual data into group averages and generate sample statistics, both about uh, central tendency and about variance. And we draw inferences from the population we have sampled from from these sample statistics. So the purpose of the sample statistics is for us to draw inferences about a population. And we use null hypothesis statistical significance tests, NHST, to accept or reject the null hypothesis that we populate, or postulated at the beginning of our process. Typically, we set alpha at p less than 0.05. If we are able to reject the null hypothesis at that alpha level, we accept some alternative hypothesis as explaining differences that we've observed in our data. We worry about type 1 error, that is the false rejection of HO. We don't worry very much about type 2 error, the false rejection of uh, HA. So that's, in essence, what the standard model is. But it's important to recognize that it isn't all Fisher's work. Uh, the bits in red are the bits that are attributable to Fisher. The bits in uh, blue are attributable to another set of contemporary statisticians, uh, Nyman and Pearson, with whom Fisher had a lifelong, bitter, and quite violent argument. And Fisher would never have accepted the bits in blue. And so we have adopted what Geiger Ringer calls the uneasy synthesis of these two, what were at the time, and in fact remain, in statistical theory, rather incompatible views of the world. Psychologists don't understand that there is this sort of peculiar uh, synthesis at the heart of the standard model that we use. Now, the standard model, despite its rapid adoption in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, did come under criticism. In fact, some of the earliest criticism in psychology dates back from 1942. But that criticism was muted, really. It didn't ever go away, but it didn't ever reach any particularly sort of threshold level of intensity until towards uh, the end of the 1980s and in the 1990s. And from that point on, 
there's been a substantial growth in the level of criticism, and it's signaled by things like the publication of Harlow's edited book on what if there were no significance tests. It led the APA to set up the Task Force on Statistical Inference, in, which produced a report in 1999, a rather weak and feeble report in my view. If you want a good summary of the controversy, there's an excellent paper by Nickerson, published in 2000. And if you want an extremely entertaining and no punches pulled account, have a look at Ziliaka McCloskey's recent book, The Cult of Statistical Significance. Ziliaka McCloskey, incidentally, are economists, not psychologists. It's fair to say that the core of this criticism, though not the only criticism, has focused on the use of NHST as the basis of the decision rule in the interpretation of our data. It's also interesting to note that behavior analysis in, has been remarkably absent from this critical discourse. There is, of course, a criticism of the standard model within behavior analysis, but that has not led behavior analysts to engage with this wider uh, conversation, critical conversation, over the past decade and a half. And I think that has been a very unfortunate lack. I think behavior analysis has a very important contribution to make, not so much to that conversation, because I think we've moved past that conversation now, but to the consequences of that critical perspective. I think we need to get involved in the next stage. If I may use an analogy, we are past, in this field, I think, argument about whether global warming is happening because of CO2. We should be at the stage of saying, what can we do about it? It's that conversation, what can we do about it, that I would now encourage behavior analysts to become engaged with. What are some of the criticisms? Well, again, I'm not going to go into, into the technical detail about these. This would be quite out of place and, and unnecessary in a way. What I want to do is to give you some quotes and ask you not only to look at the quotes, but also attend to the uh, people who are making them. These are not sort of obscure, minor figures in the field from the remote southwest Pacific. These are eminent scholars in our discipline and in related disciplines. So uh, Jacob Cohen, called NHST a religion. Schmidt and Hunter, who are leading industrial organizational psychologists, called it an addiction. Loftus, that's the cognitive Loftus, not the um, false memory Loftus, called it an enduring tyranny. Favreau, who's a feminist developmental psychologist, said it's a justification for betraying the evidence of the raw data. Think about that. The technique we rely upon at the center of our data analytic procedures is betraying the evidence of the raw data. And more recently, Ziliak and McCloskey, it's an empty and damaging ceremony. Here's some more. It's among the most questionable things we do, that's from two leading clinical psychologists and from another leading methodologist, is the most boneheadedly misguided procedure ever institutionalized in the rote training of science students. These are direct, powerful, and serious criticisms that deserve to be taken seriously. One of the most protean and eminent of all of the critics of NHST was the philosopher-scientist Paul Meal. And this is what Paul Meal said as long ago as 1967. Those, and you have to forgive him for being sexist in 1967, those who use NHST, he said, are like a potent but sterile intellectual rake who leaves in his merry path a long train of ravished maidens but no viable scientific offspring. Some a time later, uh, in 1878, he says, Sir Ronald has befuddled us, mesmerized us, and led us down the primrose path. I believe that the almost universal reliance on merely refuting the null hypothesis is a terrible mistake, basically unsound, poor scientific strategy, and one of the worst things that ever happened in the history of psychology one of the worst things that ever happened in the history of psychology. Folks, these are serious criticisms and warrant serious consideration. Given that, today, more than 90% of our research published in our leading journals still uses NHST, I guess you would conclude that these critics were somehow mistaken and that somewhere along the way, somebody had published a serious, powerful, comprehensive refutation of the, criti the criticism. Well, I can tell you that no such refutation has ever been published. There is no comprehensive, definitive refutation of these criticisms. In fact, 
those who've taken up the challenge of responding to these criticisms have almost always ended up in substance agreeing with them, although usually finding some small residual use, permissible use for NHST. So a recent paper said that generally speaking, most offenders of NHST believe that it's been misinterpreted and badly used for decades and make very little um, excuse for its use. And try and reach this rather gloomy conclusion that 75 years of attempts to remediate the misuse of NHST haven't been productive and he sees no reason to believe that any further attempts to reform NHST are going to be productive either. So he's concluded, and I think it's a very reasonable conclusion, that there's a kind of absolutely intractable problem here. NHST is deeply flawed and psychologists at least in it, the way that they use it have not been able to change the way they use it while staying within the framework of NHST so as to use it properly. This has all had some rather serious consequences. One of these, of course, is that what we think of as science has become closely identified with the standard model. It's what we indoctrinate students in in all of our research methods courses. It's become the science part of the scientist practitioner. If you're going to, whatever kind of practice you might do, and there's a lot of freedom permitted in the practice side of the scientist practitioner ideal, the science side is very tightly constrained to being a master of the standard model with its Fasherian NHST procedures at the heart. And the standard model, as I said at the beginning, has become dominant within the notion of evidence-based practice, as um, Kendall pointed out in 1998. What we accept as evidence for evidence-based practice is based upon the use of research in the standard model um, domain. Now, this identification of science with the standard model has actually seriously distorted applied research, not surprisingly, if you believe the critics. If this is a flawed method, then the use of a flawed method is likely to have adverse consequences. There are many ways that one could argue this point. What I want to show you is just some rather entertaining data, at least I think it's entertaining, um, from a paper published, um, it's a classic paper, which in fact I think all graduate students in psychology should be forced to read, published by Darcy and Anoma. They did a review of 30 years of research in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, uh, the premier journal for applied, for applied clinical research in psychology. And they looked at how competently the authors of those papers across those three decades had used the standard model research. And they found mistakes everywhere, right through the whole um, range of possible mistakes. And rather than things getting better over time, they found things actually tended to get worse over the 30 years that they investigated. But here's just a sample of what they said. Talking about the, the misuse of p-values as some index of significance or importance, we found p-values received an absurdly central position in many studies the expense of descriptive statistics. And they finally point out that there was one study they found which had no data at all. It just had p-values in it. You, you can still find examples of that. Go to the pediatrics literature, I can tell you. You'll find that quite widely. Despite the publication of the Task Force on Statistical Inference in, 19, in 1999, which was supposed to have reformed our practices, uh, nothing much has changed. Here's a continuation of the Dar, Serlin, and Omer um, study by um, Fiddler and Cumming, this is an Australian group incidentally, um, who found that essentially nothing's changed in a further um, period of uh, publication in the same eminent journal. Uh, and again, picking up another one of the criticisms that Dar Sernonoma had made, which that nobody paid any attention to clinical significance, um, they found that only 10% more in this latter survey period have started looking at clinical significance. And they note rather acerbically that this doesn't speak well for a journal in which you'd think that the clinical significance of findings would be seen as rather important. And there is, in fact, now a series of publications by different authors across different applied fields, all telling us essentially the same story, that the publication of the Task Force on Statistical Inference has made almost no difference to research practice uh, in behavioral science. So that's the, my case for the paradox of contemporary applied research, committed to evidence-based practice, but implacably resistant to changing its practices in the research which generates the evidence. And there's a second problem. That's the problem of averaging. 
This, this is a, an aspect of the standard model which has actually received much less attention than the problems of NHST, but I think it's an equally severe problem. Averaging across indivi individuals for research purposes has a history at least as long as the history of null hypothesis statistical testing. You can trace it back in time uh, to the um, 19th and the uh, middle of the 18th century, actually. And it had its origins in an attempt by philosopher philosophers and religious people to get rid of original sin. If you could average people, uh, s original sin would fall away, just of course as errors are meant to fall away in the averaging process, and you would have you know, some measure of the, of the perfect human being, the, more, the hom moyen was the term, uh, without being contaminated by original sin. And I wonder whether our colleagues who do all their averaging think that they're really doing something religious here or not. It fitted agricultural research fine when Fisher started using Why was that? Well, for two reasons. First of all, we don't tend to think of... Thank you. We don't tend to think of things like rice grains or ears of wheat as having individual differences of sufficient kind or magnitude to be really important. But we do think that individual differences matter for human beings. And, of course... Agricultural products are marketed in bulk, so the economics of agriculture mean that, that, that bulks, bulk selling is appropriate and sampling is appropriate and averaging is appropriate because of that reason. But does averaging fit psychology? Oddly enough, as far as I can work out, that question was never asked during the inference revolution. Averaging was accepted because it came as part of a package deal. And nobody stopped to ask whether it really fits a discipline in which individual differences are seen as being substantively important. But I think, and uh, other people have agreed, that it actually makes psychology a rather odd science. And um, Sidman in Tactics of Scientific Research says that what you risk by doing averaging in psychology is creating synthetic phenomena which are actually artificial and not real phenomena, uh, where the averaging process is all that links together the things being averaged. It's a fairly serious criticism. Outside of behavior analysis, where, of course, there has been a consistent criticism of, of averaging across individuals, there's been very little uh, criticism, as I said. But there's a little. And here's an example from the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who says, I believe that the fallacy of reified variation, that is, averaging, or failure to consider the full house of all cases, that is, attending to variance, plunges us into serious error again and again. One of the best accounts within psychology of the problems of averaging is in a book written by a developmental psychologist, Jan Balsner, in 1986, called The Individual Subject in Scientific Psychology. And it's a book that, if you haven't read, I recommend to you. It's a very interesting book to read. And Balsner argues, and again, this is a kind of paradox, that we have this double standard in psychology. We have, at one and the same time, an expressed deep interest in being able to understand individuals while at the same time we rapidly get rid of individuals by merging their data into a group average, which is assumed to represent some general population. And the problem with this is particularly acute in applied science, because in applied science we need to be able to apply science to individuals. As uh, James Grice said to me in a recent communication, you can't treat a population. You have to treat individuals in the population. So to carry on, Valson is... Uh, criticism, how do you get from the sample to the population and then to the individual to do your applied science at the level of the individual? Well, strictly you can't. The inference model in the standard model actually doesn't permit that. We are permitted to infer from the sample to the population as long as we actually know the population we've sampled from. And I'd bet my pension that most psychologists never bother to specify the population that they're sampling from. We then attribute generic prototypic ideal status to the population average. And this is a step of inductive generalization. And again, that's a legitimate step, though it can be misused. And we see the misuse of this inductive generalization every time we see gender uh, generalizations, just because boys score uh, at Y on average and girls score at X on average. All boys must be like Y and all girls must be at X. And those kinds of absurdities, because they are absurdities given the overlapping distributions, form the basis of public policy now 
in many education systems. So to continue, Valsana, characteristics of that abstracted individual may easily become attributed to particular concrete individuals with whom psychologists work. That's a deduction. So we've shifted from induction to hypothetical deductive models of argument. And Valsana concludes by saying that this process, this contortion that where you go from induction to inductive generalization to hypothetical deduction is guided by a number of implicit assumptions and cognitive blinders that obscure insight into the science and hamper its applications. So another sort of serious state of affairs for our science. And there have been consequences which have been uh, adverse for the scientist practitioner ideal that have arisen from this process as well. This is not new knowledge either. Remember that the scientist practitioner ideal was formally adopted only in the Boulder Conference of 1950. In the 1960s, investigations were undertaken in order to see how this model was working out in practice. And this research was published in 1972 by Bergen and Strupp. And even at this early stage, they noticed that there was a mismatch between the science embodied in the standard model and the needs of applied research. And it, it comes down fundamentally to the problems of getting from the hypothetical average type to the individuals that are actually dealt with in applied science. So we can reach a conclusion that was reached, in fact, by the, the great book about the scientist practitioner model by Barlow, Hayes, and Nelson in 1984, that the unanswered questions concerning individuals, unanswered because the problems with averaging fundamentally, will continue to puzzle the practitioner as he or she works with whomever happens to appear. This is the one single factor that requires substantial alterations in the way we do science. It has these really deep implications. We need to change the way we do our science. We need to, we need to do something about the whole package of the standard model, both NHST and averaging, in order to have an applied science that we can use uh, in an appropriate way. That applied science, or that science actually, is of course behaviour analysis. And it's single case research that is at the heart of the behaviour analysis. Now the origins again of single case research can be traced back in history. And I've given you a quote here from the great French uh, founder of experimental medicine, Claude Bernard, who was one of the important influences on B.F. Skinner. Bernard says, a physician is by no means physician to living beings in general, nor even physician to the human race, but rather physician to a human individual. And Bernard was one of the individuals, actually, who criticized the foundations of statistics that led to Fisher's model. But he and others were writing in uh, French and in German, little read by, um, by English-speaking uh, scientists. And so it had little influence. Uh, it wasn't translated into English until 1949, which meant that it came too late, really, to influence the inference revolution. But it did influence Skinner. And, of course, we know that in... Developing behavior analysis, Skinner committed it to the intensive study of the individual. And this quote here is from the last few pages of the behavior of uh, organisms in which he commits behavior analysis explicitly to prediction at the individual level and to a science that is the science of the individual. That uh, implicit science, or scientific methodology, I should say, of course was then... Um, synthesized in a more formal way in uh, Murray Sidman's Tactics of Scientific Research. Um, this is actually a scan of my um, own personal copy, and I hope you notice how tattered it's become. If you haven't got your own copy, hie you to the bookshop after, um, after the talk and buy one and start reading it. It's, it. Every page repays repeated reading. And there were so many quotes I had difficulty with. I changed the quote many times. But one of the themes that runs through Tactics is a theme that we need to realize that you really can't mix the standard model with its group averaging and its statistical inference with individual data. These, as Sidman says, are actually two different kinds of science and should be kept separate. As graduates from behavior analysis, experimental laboratories went out to the world and got actual work to do, they began to apply their knowledge of behavior processes at the individual level to cases 
and began to adapt the laboratory procedures for the applied setting. And so applied single case research designs were developed uh, and these were first synthesized, of course, in the famous book by Herzen and Barlow, Single Case Experimental Designs, in which uh, in their opening page they say individual, the individual is of paramount importance in the clinical science of human behavior. Until recently, however, the science lacked an adequate methodology. But that methodology had now been developed and they were explaining it to people. So let me just say a little bit about the characteristics of single case research, which we can contrast with the characteristics of the standard model. First of all, these are things it doesn't do. It doesn't use sampling theory, it doesn't average over participants, and it doesn't use NHST-based inference. So it's very different in fundamental ways from the standard model. What it does do is it maintains a commitment to quantification, and it uses these rigorous experimental designs that permit causal inferences. Both of these are points worth emphasizing, and I want to emphasize the first point, because back where I come from in New Zealand, the influence of postmodernist theory in the social sciences has been very great. One of the ill effects of that is that qualitative research has become very popular. And indeed, if you want to do research w with the indigenous population in New Zealand and the Maori population in New Zealand, you're basically required to do qualitative research. You couldn't get funding to do quantitative research. So there, there are real threats to quantification at large in our world. And of course, we also use rigorous experimental designs. That's not a unique feature of, of single case research designs. It's true of all experimental designs. But what is unique is the emphasis on visual analysis as a key data analytic procedure and on the use of replication as its basis for inference and induction. So let me say a couple of things about visual analysis and about replication. I th think that many behavior analysts are sometimes defensive about the use of visual analysis. It sometimes seems to us it's the kind of the poor researcher's alternative. When you can't do anything better, you do visual analysis. If you were doing better science, of course, you could put your data into SPSSX and you could do those real statistics which gave you the really good information about your, about your data. But I want people to go away today understanding that, in fact, there's no reason to be defensive about visual analysis at all. It's not um, the second best or the third best data analytic procedure. Here's a quotation that makes that point rather nicely. These authors point out that visual analysis can simultaneously do a whole lot of things and that, in fact, no other analytic technique available to us can do as much all at once. It's not second best. It's actually the best of the best. We should be proudly affirmative of visual analysis as a data analytic technique. What about the virtues of replication? Well, I love the quotation from Steger that an ounce of replication is worth a ton of inferential statistics. And again, I had a whole lot of quotes here which I've purged in the, in the interest of time. There's a very recent review of replication by uh, Schmidt in Review of General Psychology in which he says, replication is at the heart of any science. Then he goes on in his review to show that in fact replication is barely ever done in psychology and if you did do it, you couldn't get it published. So little do we think of replication as uh, an important part of science. And he contrasts that with, uh, for example, physicists who see replication as essential. Well, again, behavior analysis has replication at its heart. We live replication, we do replication. It's impossible to conceive of doing behavior analysis research without doing replication. So again, in terms of what characterizes a good science, we have something to be genuinely, affirmatively proud of. Let me go on and say a little bit more about some additional virtues of single case research. It, of course, gives us a science, both basic and applied, at the individual level. And because it does that, it resolves that complicated, inductive, hypothetical deductive process which Valsana outlined as, as being necessary if you want to be able to apply science when you're working within the standard model. And it avoids all of the problems and difficulties and dangers of averaging across cases that have been so um, well articulated by many people, including uh, Murray Sidman. 
It avoids the trap of confusing statistical with clinical significance of outcomes. And let me tell you that there is a voluminous literature documenting this error across the entire spectrum of applied behavioral science research. It is a trap into which almost everybody who uses the standard model ultimately falls. They think that P tells them something about the importance of their findings. It tells them nothing of the kind. It's most closely associated with the size of your sample and almost nothing else. And as McCloskey and Ziliak point out, uh, it's been the ruin of empirical research economics as in medicine and sociology and psychology. Single case research permits the demonstration of both efficacy and effectiveness of interventions. Now, efficacy and effectiveness have become important words in uh, behavioral science in recent times. Efficacy refers to what you find out by conducting very carefully managed randomized control trials of interventions. It's complex, it's expensive, it's difficult, and it takes a long time to do. But it's not regarded as sufficient to establish uh, that you should be using this in evidence-based practice unless you can also demonstrate effectiveness. And effectiveness is to show that the intervention is robust enough to work in real clinical or applied practice. So it's, it's, it, it, it survives the translation into the real world. Interestingly, although there's this great interest in effectiveness research, no one's really explained how you do it. You do it kind of by tweaking your randomized controlled trials, but no one's really laid out precisely how that's to be done. Well, in single case research, of course, we have one method, although it needs to be adapted to some extent, but we have essentially one method that covers the continuum from the development of your intervention idea at one end to routine clinical practice at the other. There's, there's, a, there's a continuum there which, which doesn't involve any difficulties, really, in translating from one to the other. And single case research permits the efficient mapping of generality, and I think this is, again, something which few people have grasped although the idea of the generalization map's been around for quite a while. Thank you. When you've got a colleague who's just completed their RCT and they managed to get it published in the Journal of Consultant Clinical Psychology and they've spent $3 million and 10 years of their life doing it, and you say to them, that's really wonderful. Now, of course, you need to show it's effective. And you point out to them that there are at least eight dimensions in which you need to demonstrate implicative generality. And you watch your colleague, you know, face fall at the prospect of spending the rest of their life just doing the research necessary to show that their RCT actually has generality. Well, you can say to them, I've actually got good news for you. You can do it using single case research. What you can do here is with small numbers of people, quite quickly you can test some dimension of generality. And you keep doing that until you find a boundary condition when it stops. And if you replicate that failure to boundary condition, it confirms that's a boundary. You know, beyond that age group, it doesn't work. For problems outside of that DSM diagnosis, it doesn't work. Whatever the, whatever the dimension is you're testing, you can quickly map these boundary conditions. And I think, again, we should be insisting that RCTs are followed up by appropriate single case research design to map generality and to establish effectiveness in that way. And it makes it possible, of course, to be a scientist practitioner in everyday practice, which was really the theme of Bala Hayes and Nelson's book in 1984, because even when you've established efficacy, when you've established effectiveness, you still have to know, is it working for this individual that I'm dealing with? And single case research design permits you to answer that question. And no other research design does. Not possible with the standard model to get to that level of analysis. And it, it, it enhances the ethics and accountability of research. Um, we don't have to expose large numbers of people either to the risks of the novel treatment in the, in the experimental condition, and nor do we have to deny treatment to a large number of people in the control condition. And when someone challenges you on the basis that you haven't done what you said you did, you can pull out the data. You don't have to rely on explaining you know, multivariate analysis of variance to them. They can look at the data, they can share the visual analysis with you, and they can understand what in fact happened. So given the many virtues of single case research, we could ask the question, is there a place in our discipline for group research? And I am going to answer, yeah, this perhaps is the only really um, new thing I'm going to say today. Yes, I believe that there is a place for group research, despite our commitment to studying at the level of the individual, because commitment 
a science of the individual isn't a commitment necessarily to one-on-one -on -one applied practice. And we know, we go back to Tharp and Wetzel, Behaviour Modification in the Natural Environment, 1969, the book that converted me, in fact, along with principles of behaviour into being a, a, a behaviour analyst, was all about the fact that we have to amplify our science. We can't solve the problems of the world one case at a time with one practitioner at a time. So we need to work with groups. And it's, we do, might do this because we're working with a natural group, a family, school, class, a work group, a community. Or we might be using a group therapy, a, an intervention which has some bits of it that are intrinsically reliant upon an interaction amongst the group of people for its effectiveness. Or there might, and this is probably the largest reason of all, there are reasons of pragmatic efficiency and cost effectiveness to work with groups in order to amplify and maximize our therapeutic impact. So I think there are good reasons for working with groups. The problem is that when people, even those who use behavior analysis in the development phase of their work, move towards groups, they almost always move into using the standard model and to doing inference, inferential statistics as their data analytic procedure. And I've been spending a bit of time in recent years thinking, can we, can we escape from that trap? Can we work with groups but continue to use single case research design and visual analysis as a data analytic strategy? So can we generalize single case research to group settings? And I think the answer is yes. How might we do this? Well, we have groups formed in any one of those ways I've just talked about, and we can move the group through any one of the phases of a single case research design study. Just as we move an individual from baseline into treatment and back into baseline in a reversal, we can move a group from baseline into treatment and into baseline or to maintenance. We need to acquire, for the purposes that I'm going to display anyway, uh, data as one person per phase um, or maybe as um, subphase. Uh, and this doesn't breach the rule about averaging because Sidman points out averaging across the same individual is not the same as averaging across different individuals and doesn't cause the same problems. Thank you. The problem is then how much you analyze the results visually. Well, I've developed this alternative visual analysis technique for doing this, which uses a scatter plot as the basic technique. And in the scatter plot, I'm plotting each of the, the scores in T1 in baseline against a score at some other time, uh, at T2, uh, against each other. So it looks like this. If there's no uh, measurement error, of course, the T1 and T2 scores for each, each individual will fall on the diagonal line. If there's some error in measurement, then there'll be a little slop about the line. But nonetheless, there'll be a very uh, close relationship between the two points. However, if between time one and time two, these individuals have been exposed as a group to some intervention, and that has had some effect on this measure of their behavior, then we should see a systematic switch. Things should change. And in fact, here, assuming that the uh, of a downward movement in their score at time two indicates improvement, we see these individuals have improved between time one and time two. There's an intervention effect evident in the data. And you can add a line indicating cutoff scores. So uh, here's a cutoff score. If you're above the line, uh, you are um, in, the clinical situ in the clinical range, and if you're below the line, you're not. And you can instantly see there, in fact, that three out of the five individuals have shifted over time after our treatment from the clinical to the non-clinical range. That's an immediate evidence of clinical significance, I would argue. So you don't have to do anything elaborate to work that out. It's evident in the analysis. So here's an example of a reversal design. It's completely, it's, it's real data from a real study, but it's packaged in this new way. And you can imagine that this is a study looking, say, at groups of orphans in an orphanage who've got sleep problems, and we're going to treat them with a, a sedative drug. So we have baseline here plotted against the placebo. This was a um, double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Oops, sorry, I have to go back. Um, and you can see there's no evidence of a placebo effect. The top panel is um, a low dose of the drug, and the bottom row is a high dose of the drug. Then when we introduce the drugs, you can see a little drug effect. It's, it's more evident for the high dose. And you can see one of those individuals, actually now one of his children, drops below the cutoff threshold. We go back to the placebo condition, and we get a reversal. We reintroduce the drug in the final um, panel. 
and you see that, again, there's a small but not very significant effect. There's maybe one or two individuals who now drop below. We argued in the study that, in fact, there's no good evidence for clinical significance of sedative drugs. Try to tell that for pediatricians, though. It's not very easy, I have to say. So there are some virtues and vices about this technique. I think you can see we've preserved the individual end of each case. Each data point is an individual. It's compatible with standard designs, and I've actually now shown, I haven't time to show it today, but you can do reversal, multiple baseline, changing criterion, and alternating treatments designs, all using these little postage stamps of, of um, scatter plots. And it preserves the basic baseline intervention structure of all designs. What it lacks, of course, is the time series nature that we have come, become accustomed to. We've lost that. Is that a problem? Well, it is, perhaps, but a significant number of studies are now reporting just one data point per phase, such as the studies of early intervention with autistic children, which often use just you know, a measure, say, of IQ or something of that in the baseline and then following treatment. And, of course, if we think ahead to the digital future rather than back to the print past, we can think of this as having hyperlinked data. So you click on any one of those points in the scatter plot and you get a little plot of the underlying time series data, which is related to that point. So you can make a judgment about the time series data as well as about the change that's been evident in the scatter plot. So my conclusion is that the standard model that we've been using now for um, nearly 75 years in psychology is in fact unfit for use in applied science. And that the future of research in the behavioral sciences is in jeopardy because we continue to use this quite inappropriate scientific model. Behavior analysis, though, has, in single-case research, a vital solution, and single-case research techniques are essential tools for 21st century applied science. What are the implications of this? We need to take personality for change, sorry, we need to take responsibility for changing things. We need to take personal responsibility. Those of us who are faculty need to start teaching this. We need to start challenging the dominant um, curriculum. We need to collaborate with others in doing this. There are allies out there. We need to find them. I think our organizations need to commit to changing things. And we need to do this in a cooperative and recognize it's a political process. I've suggested that we need another task force where ABA, APA, and other like organizations get together and really tackle the issue of what kind of scientific method do we teach for use in applied science in the 21st century. I want to finish with a quote. It's a quote from physicists, and I've chosen this because, of course, psychologists believe that physicists are the, are the prototypic scientists. If it's physics, it must be good science. Here's a couple of physicists talking about single-case research. When cherished ideas are in ruins at your feet, nature is challenging you to look at the world anew. What have you missed? What have you not thought of before? In such situations, it helps to focus on the most extreme cases because they are where the unknown forces may be operating most distinctly. Thank you. <laughs>